welcome to this lecture sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer, we offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event or visit iwp.edu. We'd like to thank all of our supporters who make our IWP events programs possible. To support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu forward slash donate. Today we'll be hearing from Dr. William Allen, who will deliver a lecture entitled Montesquieu's The Spirit of the Laws, a critical text. I'd like uh, to welcome to the podium IWP Professor Dennis Teddy to introduce today's speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Alator, and um, hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to see, see you all turn out for uh, what should be a very interesting lecture. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, our chancellor, who is attending with us uh, this afternoon, Dr. John Lenchowski. In the tradition of Western political thought, philosophers mindful of the fate of Socrates have held differing views and lived differing lives between the two poles of private philosophizing with friends and public or political obligations. Cicero loved Rome and philosophy, and he paid the Socratic price. Montesquieu, the subject of our lecture, did not shirk his political duties, but the baffling reserve of his writing makes the boldness of his thought daunting to bring to sight. Promoting the truth of liberty in a time of political oppression and theological fanaticism was not easy then or since. Our speaker, Dr. William Allen, has discharged his political duties in a variety of public positions. Chairman of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, member of the National Council for the Humanities, advisor to lawmakers and government executives, and more. He has taught political science to generations of fortunate students and, on his telling, learned from them as well. Dr. Allen has published a broad range of books and articles on issues of public education, on James Madison's politics, on Harriet Beecher Stowe, the Federalist and Anti-Federalist Writings, and on George Washington. His collection of Washington's documents is now the go-to volume for scholars and students. Dr. Allen's engagement with the thought of Montesquieu has been among the strongest philosophical passions of his life. Perhaps the spirit of the laws draws together all the subjects of his deepest interest what Montesquieu can teach us about human liberty, equality, and nobility, and his profound impact on the American founding as the political embodiment of those principles, which sorely need defending in our time. And now Dr. Allen offers us his fresh translation of this comprehensive and beautiful masterpiece with a commentary designed to help us understand its excellence. And today, he shares some of these reflections with us. Many of Montesquieu's thoughts and ideas bear on issues central to this institute and its purposes, national defense and security, international commerce, federalism, centralization, oppression and individual liberty, racial, religious, and ideological tyranny, and others. Dr. Allen has been a friend of IWP for years, including his Constitution Day address, his inspiring talks to critical supporters, his collaboration on a program of the Institute for Responsible Citizenship, which we hosted for outstanding black college students for the study of American founding principles. And I must add 
his warm friendship over decades with Dr. Chris Harmon and myself and others who have joined us today. Professor Allen. Thank you very much. Thank you for that warm welcome. It's a great pleasure to me to return to IWP, where in the past I've often visited with great pleasure. I must begin by saying thank you to Professors Harmon and Teddy for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to introduce this new work to you. And I, I can't, of course, get through this introduction without also acknowledging John Lenkowski, whom I visited here with often and have had such wonderful time in his company and have taken such delight in the work that he's accomplished in a relatively short period of time. Uh, you deserve great commendation for what you've done, John. Uh, we all owe you a debt of gratitude. And, and I owe all of you the debt of gratitude because this is the launch. <laughs> this is the uh, first time even I have seen <laughs> <laughs> this volume. Or as I expressed it to uh, Professor Teddy earlier today, this doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to assure you, though it's a thousand pages, it is parallel text, so you only have to read half. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, in, in before I launch into a brief discussion of this work, I want to say that we, there are copies available uh, as we conclude the discussion this afternoon, and I'll be happy to sit out there and to uh, add an autograph for anyone who desires it uh, before we depart for the evening. So you will, I think, have arrangements at the desk in the lobby for that purpose. So th that said, let me launch into this, which in some respects is, of course, a familiar topic, at least for those versed in the founding of the United States and the deliberations of the founding fathers, because we are aware of the extent to which they often cited this noble Frenchman, Charles, the second doc, Baron de Montesquieu de la Dread, who provided for us the justification for the separation of powers and the checks and balances, the idea of the extended republic and numerous other features of modern politics with which we are familiar, or at least would like to think ourselves so. And so I'm not going to dwell on what you know today. I'm going to talk about those aspects of this great work that perhaps might be less familiar to you, and that might give a context for those constitutional principles that we find so dear. And in doing that, my purpose is twofold. It is, first of all, to enlarge our understanding of the contribution that this philosopher has made in shaping the modern world. Secondly, my purpose is to introduce you to wider fields of reflection to which end, I will also provide a surprise. I won't tell you what that is until I get to the end. <laughs> but I want you to know that the surprise that is waiting is the glue that holds the entire work together and that gives us the foundation for reappropriating the spirit of the laws as part of our national discourse, for it is to be frankly acknowledged that the work has fallen out of currency in general. 
It's not a surprising thing. That often happens with older works. Or more importantly, familiar works. Let me illustrate that. Some 40 years ago, <laughs> I shudder to think it's been that long. <laughs> Some 40 years ago, I took up the question of George Washington, than which there was perhaps nothing more familiar to us, at least in the United States. But I took it up at a time when we had essentially lost all significant understanding of who George Washington was and had buried him in a mere symbolism of the founding and had no contact with the substantial contributions that he had made. And so I took up that topic, that familiar topic which we no longer knew, in order to invite us to know it again. And it has been one of the rewards of my professional career that we have taken to that task with serious energy and have largely reappropriated George Washington. And I would sincerely hope that we can equally well take seriously the task of reappropriating Montesquieu. If we need encouragement to that end, I would remind us of one fact. In the founding of the United States, after the Bible, there was no single authority cited with greater frequency than Montesquieu. I, that may seem hard to understand because we are all educated people and we've certainly not heard it so frequently <laughs> cited. In fact, what we've heard instead was John Locke as somehow the origin of the ideas that animate this political system. But the reality is, in the context of the late 18th century, it was Montesquieu who was cited, not John Locke. Oh, occasionally there was a citation of Locke. I'm not trying to depreciate his significance. But comparatively, minor, when we look at him next to Montesquieu. So that we have reason to think that perhaps we have neglected something if we have not returned to the perspective that animated those who originated the line of thought that produced this political system with which we are so familiar. Now, that also happens to figure significantly in the account of Montesquieu that I provide in the commentary that accompanies this translation. For the very first words of the commentary are the observation that there's a great silence in the spirit of the laws. And that silence is about John Locke, who goes unmentioned in the spirit of the laws, although he was well known to the author of the spirit of the laws. Montesquieu engaged in extensive correspondence with friends in England, in which they often took jibes at Locke for his pretentiousness. <laughs> They were aware of his work, and he certainly had occasion to cite it. He did not fail to cite the work of Thomas Hobbes, Locke's predecessor in England, or many other great thinkers. And he was aware of the role of Locke in the revolution in England at the close of the 17th century. But he never once cited Locke, which for the intelligent observer can only mean one thing. Montesquieu invites us to ask, why do you not cite Locke? 
And we perhaps find the beginning of a response to that question in the fact that Montesquieu also does not base his political reflections on the idea of a social contract. He does tell us that there is a natural state without using the construct of the state of nature and therefore without recourse to the correlative social contract that governs the emergence from the so-called state of nature. Why does he do that? Montesquieu has an alternative account of human sociality than we find in any other modern source. That alternative account is that the family is the foundation of society, not meandering savages, but families. And it is that intimate union that constructs the family that produces ultimately the broader social context in which we find the emergence of politics. And so he tells us at the outset of his work that what he wants us to understand is how from that broader social reality, that broader social context, we can discern the operation of those natural laws, those natural principles, which provide occasion for the development of human sociality. And we can go beyond a merely anthropological account of where human society comes from, but we can point towards its end an end which I have described as peaceable, amiable sociality. Now that's not the end of classical philosophy, but it is an end. Nor is it distant from the end of classical political philosophy. And it has a distinct advantage for it describes not an abstraction that we may try to imagine, but it describes who we are. For it is certainly not something that will escape your attention. That the ideal is not merely an ideal when it's described as peaceable amiable sociality, but rather an account of what we aim for in all our exertions. We aim to live in company with fellows and to do so without conflict. Peaceable, amiable sociality. And so I in the opening chapter of my commentary, address the question of the spirit of Montesquieu in order to demonstrate how he builds an architecture which is designed to realize that aspiration in concrete constitutional form, which means being the pedant that I am, that I begin with the first word. <laughs> and the first word is, of course, the title of the book itself, Esprit. We can forget the preposition de l'esprit. Esprit, which we, of course, translate as spirit. But that has tended to mislead us. It has tended to make us think rather ethereally than concretely. And of course, one is not likely to have written so large a book as Montesquieu did 
with the emphasis he places on its usefulness in order to invoke its ethereality. So what does spirit mean? Let's go back. Look it up. Go to the OED. Better yet, go to the canonical French dictionaries, because, of course, he looked in French, and he was French. And one of the things you will discover is that the first acceptation, the first meaning that will appear in Mitre, and Robert, and the Académie Française, and all of the canonical dictionaries is reason. Next, mind, and so forth on through a very long list of acceptations before you get to what we think of as spirit, which is why my commentary is entitled The Mind Behind the Laws, because we could very well translate the title of the work itself about the mind of the laws, or about the reason of the laws. And you would be well advised to ask me, well, why didn't you do that? And I would be prompt to respond to you, because tradition deserves respect. <laughs> it has always been called the spirit of the laws, and I will not depart from it. But I won't hesitate to tell you what it actually means. It means the reason of the laws, the mind of the laws. Now, why should that be? Because, as he tells us in the very first book, when he's describing the emergence of positive law in particular in chapter three of the first book, that all of these things that we see the claims made upon us by the positive laws, the references to justice, to equity, and such things, all have their existence prior to the existence of the laws themselves. And he uses a geometrical figure to convey this to us. He tells us that the radii of the circle were equal before the circle that they are, in fact, what produce the circle. Justice, equity, those principles exist before we advert to them naturally. They have a foundation in natural law. Now, there are many theorists and historians who have exerted themselves to prove that Montesquieu was not a natural law thinker, that Montesquieu had no metaphysics. I believe if you were to query Montesquieu about that, he would explain metaphysics are not necessary to explain the phenomena that we witness. It requires only that we situate the phenomena relative to that which the phenomena, in fact, present to our understanding. And that's how we discover, just as good old Euclid did, that equality doesn't emerge from construction, from our attributing it to things. It is that which makes it possible for us to identify things in the first place. It is the, let us say, axiomatic reality of equality that makes it possible for us to deduce the relations of equality. It is the axiomatic existence of justice that makes it possible for us to claim justice, and so forth. So it is on such a foundation of this, as this that what we discover in the spirit of the laws 
is that there is a way for us to understand the development, and I use the word development deliberately, not the word evolution, the development of human society as nothing more than the presentation of the phenomena of human beings exercising reason upon the contingencies that they confront. The contingencies of existence, which are both material, terrain, climate, all the sorts of things that come to mind when we speak of the word material, and moral, for the foundation of human sociality and existence itself upon reason imports of necessity error. He tells us this in literal terms at the opening of the spiritual laws when he says, all natural things obey the laws of nature, but some do so less well than others, and especially human beings. <laughs> Why? because their nature requires them to mediate the operation of the natural laws through reason, choice, deliberation. And it is that presence of reason in human beings in reaction to the requirements of nature that creates the degree of variance that we experience in our observations of the human thing. So it's a very straightforward explanation, and I haven't even gotten to politics yet. <laughs> I haven't said a word about <laughs> constitutions and regimes, but of course those things all follow. So he proceeds straightforwardly into the demonstration that that goal of peaceful, amiable sociality runs into difficulties precisely because the operations of reason are subject to error and perhaps contingent influences, not just external but also internal. Think of the passions. That's just one example. Which means that the minute the societies begin to grow beyond the immediate limits of the family, the nuclear family to be sure, but even the slightly extended family, such that communities are forming, human beings being the rational creatures that they are, see the opportunity for advantages. And this is the literal language he uses. And that some clever fellow will see this power of the group as something to be taken into his or her own hands. <laughs> and hence, there emerges from the initial formation of society, power, command. And that is illimitable in principle. So let me emphasize that. Power is in principle illimitable. I know we all want to take shelter from power. We all think there needs to be some device whereby we can protect ourselves from it. And in the abstract, of course, that is impossible. Just as it is impossible in the abstract to protect ourselves from the avalanche or any other contingency that is overwhelming. It is another natural contingency. But Montesquieu doesn't, because of that, revert to arguments of surrender or despair, but rather raises the question of what it can be done by human beings to escape illimitable power. What can be done to confine power? And hence, the whole regime analysis that we find is nothing other than the laying out of an argument in the first place for how politics comes to be. 
Now, you must observe, I distinguish between power and politics. Politics is the response to power. That's Montesquieu's argument. Human beings, in the face of the contingency of power, develop politics in the hope of confining power. And they do that initially with some primitive forms of regimes. Republics, aristocratic or democratic, and monarch monarchies, monarchical. He mentions a third form, which is not properly speaking a regime, and that's called despotism. And in the course of his argument, you will come to understand that despotism is no politics at all. It is illimitable power. It is that against which the other forms are reacting. And they react in differing ways because human reason is subject to variance. And they think, if we can be virtuous enough, there will be no despots among us. And so they build republics especially democratic republics. And then they think, well, it's hard to keep us virtuous, and we need to have a nice leadership cadre, and so we will have an aristocratic republic with a few virtuous who keep everybody else in line. And sometimes we think, that doesn't work because they tend to squabble and fight among themselves. Let us just have one really good person, a monarch, to keep everybody else in line. And thus the argument develops. And these are the prototypes. These are the constitutions. And each of these distinct choices is centered on a principle. Either virtue will do it, or honor will do it, etc. But Montesquieu concludes ultimately that they do not work. Not that they don't work abstractly. For example, there are some aspects of a nice civil, virtuous dem democracy that are appealing. The trouble is, it is impotent in the face of any serious threat. <laughs> it has to be small. They can't defend themselves. Nice idea, but won't work in practice. That's one way of putting it. <laughs> and he goes on from there to show the intrinsic defects to all the imperfect constitutions. But he doesn't give up because he's exhausted the possibility of constitutions. He becomes instead the architect of modernity. He becomes the architect of a deliberate constitutionalism which is free from the limitations he has defined through the course of the first eight books. Now, that would lead me ordinarily into a discussion of Book 11, Constitutionalism, Separation of Powers, Checks and Balances. Now, I'm not going to do that. You can go read that. But I'm going to do something perhaps unusual in this respect. It's try to explain why he's going through this process, what the architecture aims to accomplish leaving the details to be filled in for later. For one of the things that becomes quite apparent in the course of the argument, the argument ultimately for what I call liberal reform, is identification of four cardinal human virtues, or values, or goods is a better term. That's what I call it in the book, the cardinal human goods. And those are virtue, liberty, justice, and constitutionalism. And they must be understood in that order. Virtue, liberty, justice, and constitutionalism. For it is for the sake of virtue that liberty is necessary. Virtue, of course, reflecting choices that conduce to the good. 
But choice presupposes liberty. The exercise of choice means to be at liberty. Liberty, on the other hand, is a curious human good in that it is necessary even to convey or pursue the idea of the good, but at the same time, it is subject to the reality of politics. And so he emphasizes it actually has two forms of expression. One is political liberty, and the other is the liberty of the citizen. And he describes them in separate books in the spirit of the laws. So what is political liberty? Political liberty is a constitutional order that limits power, an architecture that confines power, that makes space for the operation of liberty. That is a chief, just as liberty is a condition of virtue, political liberty is itself the condition of liberty in general. That, if it's going to confine political power, means, of course, you're going to ultimately have to come to some device, some architecture, constitutionalism, to accomplish that. But there's an intervening step. So after liberty, you don't leap immediately into constitutionalism. You have to recognize justice. Justice, both substantive and procedural and he carefully distinguishes the two. Now, the question is, how does justice come into this, given this sequence I'm laying out for you? And he makes it clear. And in fact, this may be in some ways the signal contribution of the work. The central books of the spirit of the laws, and that is book 15, 16, and 17, are all on the single topic of slavery. He addresses that question with the very explicit argument that slavery is unjust, substantively. He introduces that after having discussed procedural justice in books 12 and 13, because it is controlling procedural justice that conduces to the liberty of the citizen as distinct from political liberty. So you have political liberty, that's going to require constitutionalism, a structure that limits power. Then you have the liberty of the citizen, that means making certain that the citizen as an individual is not subject to anyone's arbitrary will. That's why he says things such as there's no such thing as a thought crime. Okay? And that's procedural justice. That's not a preference for the good of another, to use the Aristotelian definition of justice. That is fair processes. So then he turns in book 15, 16 and 17, to substantive justice. Now what's distinguishing about this is the following. The argument against slavery is not made on the basis of contingencies. It is made as an absolute, on the basis of natural law. He says both reason and religion condemn slavery. It's an extraordinary argument for the time, and in some ways, the original of the abolitionist argument at least in a secular sense. It is where abolitionism in the modern world begins. Now when he's done that, he's able then to resume his discussion about contingencies, which he does in book 18. I'm not going to go into all that today, but you will see later why that's important if you read the commentary. But having done that much, he's now able to take up the question of constitutionalism, which was already present implicitly in the defense of liberty. He tells us in Book 11, liberty is the object of what ultimately comes to be the extended constitution or the extended republic, the constitution deliberately designed 
for the purpose of confining power and creating that space for the operation of liberty, which I call, in his account, libertarian individualism. Having done that, he can then defend constitutionalism, the last of the cardinal human goods, as the precondition for justice. Justice, of course, being the substantive foundation for the liberty, which is the precondition for virtue. And in that manner, presents the entire portrait of the human experience insofar as we seek to convey that experience through political form. Now, there's a lot more to the book after that. And we, of course, are not going to go through the whole book or try to summarize it. But you may want to inquire, what then ultimately is the significance of all this? If I call him the architect of modernity, so I'm going to present that briefly in two forms, and then we'll come to my surprise. In the first place, the book is published in 1748. That's exactly 100 years after the Treaty of Westphalia. The Treaty of Westphalia originates the modern world, the nation state. The whole human experience has altered apparently forever by the invention of the nation state. No more sociality on the basis of blood, religion, tribe, or any of those other limited closed society approaches. The question is, does it have a future, the nation state? Can it last? What is done in 1748 in the spirit of the wars is to create an architecture on the basis of which the nation state can endure, in which the reality of political exist existence based on boundaries, on geopolitics, rather than internal dynamics. That is a transition in the world that, in fact, has pervaded the entire world. All humanity today lives under the constraint of organization in the form of the nation state. These principles, this architecture, is designed precisely to realize life in the nation state. It is what made possible the conception of the extended republic or the extended constitution, as I prefer to say, i.e., the possibility of expanding the limitations of power beyond the confines of limited communities. That became crucial, both for the, con the possibilities of prosperity within given societies and for the sake of fostering some at least diminishing of hostilities among societies. I do not say eliminating. Montesquieu is quite the realist in describing the realities of life and the potentialities for conflict and the dangers to which states are subject vis-a-vis -vis one another. He does not in any way present any of those vague dreams about universal peace that characterize other modern thinkers from time to time. But he does open up a door that is important. And that is a door that says, it becomes possible to live in a world in which separate societies are nevertheless sufficiently interpenetrated one with another that you diminish the likelihood of grave conflict. And that's the utmost, the apogee of his argument in that respect. That, that, that's the best you can aim for. Sufficient interpenetration 
to diminish the likelihood of grave hostility. Now he does that in the face of an argument in Herodotus, which says that religion cannot propagate across cultures. And so the task is to respond to Herodotus, to actually, as it were, empirically make an assessment about that claim. And Montesquieu concludes that Herodotus is wrong. Now, he's able to conclude that Herodotus is wrong partly on the evidence of Christianity, which he calls in the 24th book of the Spirit of the Laws the greatest gift that mankind has ever received. Why is it the greatest gift? Well, it could be, of course, because of salvation. But it is also perhaps because it disproves Herodotus. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> now, in, in, in citing that, he's building upon something that becomes readily identifiable to us as the crux of modernity, apart from its political foundation. And that is, of course, what we like to think of as its economic relation. But we have a fairly narrow view of that, whereas Montesquieu does not. Montesquieu's view of economics actually forces us to go back and reread the whole work in the terms that I'm now presenting to you. For when he describes commerce, he's not talking about mere trade in goods. He's talking about trade in goods and ideas. He's talking about communication, intercourse. And he makes clear that the extended constitution's existence depends upon that degree of commerce in the broad sense across nations. Nations must become interpenetrable, i.e. open. They cannot be the closed cities envisioned in Plato's laws. So as you put all the pieces together, you begin to realize, quickly enough, this is a general architecture for modernity. This is where it begins. It doesn't begin in anomic individualism, atomism. It begins in natural sociality based on the family, the development of politics, and then a deliberate architecture designed to build in the advantages of the original instincts toward peaceable, amiable sociality. That is what the work is about. Now, I said I had a surprise for you. And the surprise is this. This is supposed to be the third translation, full translation, of the Spirit of the Laws. And as I completed it and sent it to press, I was quite sure that that was the case. And then I discovered that the royal archives in England from the reign of George III had only just been opened up starting in 2016 and included the release in 2019 of a manuscript by George III, who was not George III then, he was just Prince of Wales at that point in 1754, but by George III, a several hundred page manuscript in which he has translated slash paraphrased the spirit of the law. <laughs> and so now I have to settle for being fourth rather than third. <laughs> but more importantly, however, what's really tremendous in this discovery, which we're fast at work upon, uh, is this, and I've read a fair amount of it now, and I've been as much blown away by reading George III as I originally was by reading Montesquieu. George III has come down to us too familiar and too unknown. 
He was not, as the fake news of the Declaration would have it, a tyrant. He was a liberal reformer. Fully informed by these ideas of constitutional architecture, laid out at great length in his youthful hand, not just in translating the spirit of the laws, but essays on despotism, on the management of parliament, on the education of a prince, and it goes on and on. I could give you a great deal of it already, but there's much more to be done. And he had one task, and that was to realize the principles he had taken in in the Constitution of England. And the first thing to be accomplished in that respect was to turn back the practices of the Whigocracy, the practices under his grandfather and father in the age of the Robinocracy, where the prime minister was the vice regent or vizier to the monarch. And in that posture, gave the monarch commands to the parliament, set the agenda for the parliament. Yes, it already existed after 1689 and the subsequent settlement, 1721 and otherwise, as a constitution in which the monarch was limited because parliament had to supply revenues. He couldn't have them on his own. But nevertheless, the monarch still was in command and exerted that command through the prime minister. And the reform George III was attempting was to force the prime minister not to speak on behalf of the monarch to the parliament, but to speak on behalf of the parliament to the monarch, to take representation seriously. This was George's project. Now, he wanted to do this also in the context of an extended constitution. He wanted to extend the kingdom. And it was an open question whether that was possible. But he learned from Montesquieu that it should be possible. And he sought to accomplish it. And we might think, oh, well, too bad, George. You lost British North America. It wasn't possible. But that would be premature. Actually, it was possible, and he demonstrated it. How did he demonstrate it? The conquest of Canada. The extended English constitution came into being when Canada was conquered and peacefully and stably integrated into the kingdom. Now, geographically, that's as great a test, and greater still, than would have been the test of integrating the British North American colonies. So it was possible. It could have worked. But there was this vital difference. Canada was taken by conquest, and England had a free hand to ingest it and integrate it as it would. And as we know, Canada didn't, in fact, become independent until well beyond the middle of the 20th century. So it lasted a long time. It proved it could work, and it could have worked here. But unfortunately, forcing the parliament to become a policy-making body, rather than simply receiving directions from the monarch, created a series of fits and starts it was no accident that between his accession in 1762 and 1770, a mere eight years, he used as many prime ministers in those years as he had years. Because <laughs> he was trying to find the right formula, get somebody to do the thing properly. And naturally, they made lots of bad decisions in those fits and starts, which bad decisions became the provocation that led to the revolution. They began, for example, with declaring the Western territories off limits to the colonists, breaking a pledge that had been made to the soldiers who fought in the Seven Years' War. 
and we know about the whole taxing and all the rest of it and everything else that happened in between, back and forth, back and forth, the ultimate declaratory act asserting complete power. But by the time it was done, the colonies were lost. And so we may ask ourselves, does this liberal reformer George understand what he did? But I suggest a different question. Was it perhaps worth the cost of losing the colonies to carry out the reforms George carried out? After all, the British Constitution we know today is the Constitution that George founded. Its successful existence since that time doesn't speak ill of his efforts. If it cost British North America, ah, so what? It worked. Which means, of course, it is time for us to revisit the revolution, <laughs> to revisit George III, and that will be the next book. <laughs> <laughs>